Was there an eclipse when Jesus died? Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 39 presents the account of Jesus' last moments before he died. The path that led him to the cross was filled with pain and suffering. He was mistreated, scorned, humiliated, and tortured. Now, as he hung on the cross, he took his final breath. Mark chapter 15, verse 33. When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. There was thick darkness over the whole land. Now the scripture was fulfilled, as it is written in Amos chapter 8, verse 9. In Amos 8, verse 9, we read, And it will come about on that day, declares the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and make the earth dark in broad daylight. The people had often demanded a sign from heaven. Now they had one, but it symbolized their eyes blinding. It was 12 o'clock in the afternoon, and the darkness continued until 3 o'clock. The darkness appeared otherworldly, as it happened during the brightest time of day. Many people have asked if this was an eclipse. Was it a coincidence? Was it even divine? And if it was an eclipse, what exactly was it? This darkness was most likely caused by divine intervention. In his writings, Flagon of Trollies describes an extraordinary solar eclipse that took place during the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad. Eusebius also quotes Flagon's account, in which he states that during this event, the day turned into a night at the sixth hour. Stars were visible in the sky, and a powerful earthquake rocked Bithynia, causing significant damage to the city of Nicaea. Flagon attributes the darkness to the eclipse, which seems like a natural explanation. During the period when this event occurred, knowledge of astronomy was very basic. Flagon, a historian, also mentions an earthquake, which aligns closely with the religious narrative. In line with this, St. Chrysostom said, The created world could not tolerate the injustice committed against its creator. Therefore, the sun hid its rays, not wanting to witness the evil deeds. The darkness that occurred during this critical moment can have various meanings. First, darkness was associated in antiquity with mourning. Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 27 through 28 says, For this is what the Lord says, The whole land shall be a desolation, yet I will not execute a complete destruction. For this the earth will mourn, and the heavens above will become dark. Because I have spoken, I have purposed, and I have not changed my mind, nor will I turn from it. Someone once commented that, while he was suffering, all the world suffered with him, for the sun was darkened. The darkness that occurred during Jesus' death was perceived as a sign of lamentation from the sun. This type of darkness was often associated with the death of great men, and both Gentile and Jewish readers could interpret it as a cosmic sign that accompanied the death of a king. Additionally, darkness was seen as a symbol of God's judgment. According to the Gospels, darkness enveloped the land during Jesus Christ's crucifixion. The scriptures show that the darkness began at the sixth hour, which was noon in Jewish timekeeping, and continued until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. Therefore, the darkness persisted for around three hours. The duration of the solar eclipse mentioned in the text seems too long. Furthermore, it is essential to note that Jesus died during the Passover, which always occurs when the earth is between the sun and the moon. A solar eclipse, on the other hand, can only happen when the moon is between the earth and the sun. This darkness during Jesus' crucifixion resulted from God's miraculous intervention, much like the ninth plague in Egypt. It is important to note that these past events do not indicate that God uses natural astronomical occurrences as biblical signs. So question remains, what about future events? Between the hours of nine in the morning and noon, there was enough daylight for the people who opposed Jesus to witness his suffering and mock him. There could be no mistake about the fact that he was nailed to the cross, for he was crucified in broad daylight. We are fully convinced that it was Jesus of Nazareth, as both friends and foes witnessed his agonies. For three long hours, the false bearers sat and watched him on the cross, making jests of his miseries. I am grateful for those three hours of light. Without them, those who oppose our faith would have doubted if the body of our beloved master was truly nailed to the tree. They would have spread baseless rumors. 
Where would have been the witnesses to the solemn scene if the sun had been hidden from morning until night? The fact that three hours of light were available for inspection and witness bearing shows the wisdom that it did not allow the window of opportunity to close too soon. The creature could not bear the wrong done to its creator. Therefore the sun withdrew his rays, that he might not behold the deeds of the wicked. The darkness occurring at such a critical moment can signify several things. What a wake-up call that must have been for the careless sons of men. The people didn't know that the Son of God was with them or that he was working out human redemption. The most important hour in history seemed to pass without being noticed until night rushed out of her rooms and took over the day. What does this darkness mean? asked everyone. Things stopped moving. The plow stopped in the middle of a trench, and the axe stopped raised. Even though it was the middle of the day and the people were usually very busy, they all stopped for a moment. This darkness was said to cover the whole land, or as Luke puts it, over all the earth. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that darkness would cover the land in the middle of the day. It was entirely outside the natural order of things. Some people deny the existence of miracles. It is quite perplexing to me that someone who believes in God should be skeptical about the possibility of miracles. The darkness that occurred during our Lord's death seems to have been necessary and appropriate. If we were to document the story of his death, omitting the darkness would result in a significant omission. The symbol represents what our Lord Jesus Christ went through. The darkness surrounding him symbolized the darkness inside him. In Gethsemane, a thick darkness fell upon his spirit. He was in extreme sorrow, even to the point of death. His joy was his connection with God, but that joy was lost, and he was in the dark. The darkness seemed to stretch on endlessly until the Lord Jesus spoke, breaking the silence that had grown terrifyingly still. He recited a psalm, specifically the 22nd Psalm, asking God why he had been forsaken, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If we find ourselves in a dark and gloomy place, we should not despair because the Lord Christ was there too. And in all these things, there is one more thing that happened. Jesus experienced a lot of pain and hardship during his life, which affected him physically and emotionally. However, even though he was aware of the challenges he faced, he never lost his connection with his father. At one point, it may have seemed like God had abandoned him, but Jesus still held on to his faith. People noticed this. The soldier that saw the last minutes of Jesus. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, they were terribly frightened and filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. Matthew chapter 27 verses 53 through 54. It was the centurion's job to ensure that the crucifixion was carried out correctly and without any complications. He was usually in charge of a hundred soldiers at the time of the crucifixion. He was a career soldier whose courage and intelligence had helped them rise through the ranks. He would be a soldier of the highest order. He would need to be both cold and efficient to succeed in this position. This man had to follow the orders of his superiors. The scene at the crucifixion of Jesus was so remarkable that even a hardened Roman centurion acknowledged that this was the Son of God. This realization meant Jesus was innocent of the crime. Jesus was on the cross for that very reason. The centurion must have had a mix of emotions. He just realized he had supervised the crucifixion of an innocent man. This was not the whispered words of a frightened recruit or the quavering words of a conscript who was easy to manipulate. These were the reasoned conclusions reached by a seasoned veteran, a man who watched countless men suffer horrible ends and was responsible for putting them to death. This centurion was well aware of the strong condemnation of the Jewish religious leaders who had put Jesus on the cross for blasphemy. His commander-in-chief, Pontius Pilate, had sustained the conviction for Jesus' making that claim, but the centurion forsake the condemnation and declares Jesus' claim. Why? Because the arguments in favor of Christ were overwhelming. We must remember that this man had no doubt supervised many crucifixions, yet there was something extraordinarily different about this particular execution. What did he see? 
Several scenes from the events of the arrest, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus combine into a compelling statement. The centurion had seen, heard, and felt all of the events of the crucifixion and the death of Christ. As a result, he and his troops became very frightened. Even though the centurion and his group of soldiers had learned to cope with fear, they were now experiencing sheer terror. Jesus not only impacted rough and hardened men, like the Roman centurion, but he also impacted women, even women, like Mary Magdalene. The pulpit commentary relates the tradition that the centurion's name was Longinus and that he became a devoted follower of Jesus, preached the gospel, and died as a martyr. This is just tradition. We do not know if this happened, but we do know that the truth has a way of holding on to a person's heart. The cross of Jesus has the power to change the individual. The centurion began as a Roman officer, overseeing a crucifixion, but ended the day acknowledging that Jesus was the Son of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 For the message of the cross is foolishness, absurd and illogical, to those who are perishing and spiritually dead, because they reject it. But to us who are being saved by God's grace, it is the manifestation of the power of God. But we preach Christ crucified a message which is to Jews a stumbling block that provokes their opposition, and to Gentiles foolishness, just utter nonsense, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Gentiles. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23-24 through 24. God has been known to use darkness in significant events, such as during the ninth plague on Egypt and at the time of Christ's crucifixion. However, some Christian leaders have attempted to use these examples to support the notion that God uses eclipses. Let's take a closer look at these events to gain a better understanding. Ninth Plague on Egypt The plague that caused darkness throughout Egypt was not a solar eclipse because eclipses only last minutes or sometimes seconds. The darkness over Egypt lasted three days. The Israelites were not affected by the darkness. The darkness was not an eclipse, but a special miracle performed by God. Heavenly Signs and the Sixth Seal As we have mentioned before, Bible prophecy predicts future heavenly signs. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, the sixth seal caused the sun to turn black as sackcloth of hair and the moon to appear like blood. The main verse that has led some to believe recent astronomical occurrences are end-time markers is that the real heavenly signs will be global, unmistakable, and totally unnatural. However, it is unclear whether this prophecy refers to an eclipse. During a solar eclipse, the sun appears to go dark due to the alignment of the sun, moon, and earth. However, the moon does not turn red during this phenomenon. On the other hand, a blood moon occurs during a lunar eclipse when the sun, earth, and moon align, but this does not cause the sun to go dark. Therefore, it is unlikely that Revelation chapter 6 verse 12 is referring to a solar or a lunar eclipse, as both events would have to occur simultaneously for the verse to hold true. In addition to this event, there will be other celestial signs such as the stars of heaven falling to the earth, which are most likely meteorites and every mountain and island being moved out of its place, which is likely the result of powerful earthquakes that will shake the earth. Revelation chapter 6, verses 13 through 14. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth, like a fig tree shedding its late summer figs when shaken by a strong wind. The sky was split, separated from the land, and rolled up like a scroll, and every mountain and island were dislodged and moved out of their places. The real heavenly signs will be global, unmistakable, and totally unnatural. They'll be caused by God's direct intervention, not the natural alignment of earth and moon. These heavenly signs will mark the beginning of a prophetic time period called the Day of the Lord. This future time period will be preceded by other prophetic events that have not yet transpired or come to their fullness. A summary of these events is as follows. First, religious deception. The second event is wars and rumors of wars. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, corresponding to the second seal of Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 through 4. The third event is worldwide famines. Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, corresponding to the third seal of Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. 
The fourth event is worldwide pestilences. Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. Corresponding to the fourth seal of Revelation, chapter 6, verses 7 through 8. These first four are called the beginning of sorrows. Matthew chapter 24, verse 8. Even though we see these signs represented in world trends today, they will reach greater intensity in the future. Matthew chapter 24, verse 8. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs, of the intolerable anguish in the time of unprecedented trouble. They are followed then by other events, such as hostile persecution against God's true church and the abomination of desolation. Matthew chapter 24, verse 21 indicates these events are all connected with the Great Tribulation. The heavenly signs mentioned earlier occur immediately after the Tribulation. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29, corresponding to the sixth seal, Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. These astronomical disturbances will be seen and felt by the whole world, as opposed to eclipses, which pass through a narrow corridor and are never visible to everyone around the globe. This was not the only mysterious things that happened. Four things that happened after Jesus died. Number one, there was an earthquake. There was a response of creation after Jesus died. We read, number two, the tombs opened. Matthew then records an incident found in none of the other gospels. While earthquakes can damage tombs since they were carved out of stone, the raising of bodies can only be attributed to God's direct action, which implies that he is behind the earthquake. Their appearance to people in Jerusalem is a witness to the efficaciousness of Jesus' work on the cross and the declaration of his victory over death in his and their resurrection. This anticipates Paul's teaching of Jesus being the first fruits of the dead. The raising of those holy ones is a foretaste of the resurrection to which all believers can look forward. Through the death of Jesus, a new day has arrived, a day when death has been defeated by death, and resurrection to life eternal has been made possible. But notice that it was not until after the resurrection of Jesus that the occupants of these tombs were raised and went into Jerusalem, where they appeared to many. The Bible does not say whether these risen saints died again or went to heaven with the Lord Jesus. The death of the Son of God shook nature itself. Popular preacher Charles Spurgeon stated, Men's hearts did not respond to the agonizing cries of the dying Redeemer, but the rocks responded. The rocks were rent. He did not die for rocks, yet rocks were more tender than the hearts of men, for whom he shed his blood. It is best to understand that Matthew intended for us to see that the earthquake occurred on the day that Jesus was crucified. Then, on the day he was revealed as resurrected, the power of new life was so strong that it brought back some of the good people who had died. This is one of the strangest passages in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew does not provide us with a great deal of information, and we do not learn about this occurrence from any other source. Number 3. The temple veil was cut in two. Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 through 51. And Jesus cried out again with a loud, agonized voice and gave up his spirit, voluntarily, sovereignly dismissing and releasing his spirit from his body in submission to his Father's plan. And at once, the veil of the Holy of Holies of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split apart curtain that covered the temple was ripped in two places. The curtain was the only thing in the temple that differentiated the holy area from the holiest part of the temple. It was a very clear illustration of the separation between God and man. Acts chapter 6 verse 7 says that in the days of the early church, a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Perhaps this torn veil demonstrated to them the greatness of the work of Jesus. It is also probably how the torn veil became common knowledge. Now Christ is our superior high priest, and as believers in his finished work, we partake of his better priesthood. We can now enter the Holy of Holies through him. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 through 20 says, We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. When we look at this scene, we perceive a picture of Jesus' flesh being torn for us, just as he was tearing the veil for us. The book of Hebrews provides a glorious detailed explanation of the profound meaning that is associated with the tearing of the veil. 
The veil that was always hanging in the temple served as a constant reminder that sin makes human beings unworthy to be in God's presence. The fact that the sin offering was presented once a year, in addition to the myriad of other sacrifices that were presented on a daily basis, was a glaring illustration of the reality that sin could not be really atoned for or eradicated by mere animal sacrifices. Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, the boundaries that used to separate God and people have been destroyed, and we can now approach God with confidence and boldness. Jesus' body was torn, and so was the veil, each indicating that now we can come to God boldly. We have a high priest who presides over the heavenly courts to make certain the believers have total access. At the moment Christ died, the heavy, woven curtain separating the two main rooms of the temple was torn by an unseen hand from top to bottom. The death of God's Son was also accompanied by huge tremors in the natural world, as if there was some sort of emotional connection between inanimate creation and the one who made it. While they gambled for Jesus' possessions, Jesus' concern was for their forgiveness. It was not for his escape. What a powerful statement. Clearly, the centurion was shocked to be witness to such a dramatic event during the last hours of Christ, especially since he had never previously seen such a thing. This made the impact on him almost immeasurable. The centurion had seen, heard, and felt all of the events of the crucifixion and death of Christ. As a result, he and his troops became very frightened. Even though the centurion and his group of soldiers had learned to cope with fear, they were now experiencing sheer terror. It is that powerful cross and the love displayed there that moves hearts, even the hardened, battle-weary heart of a career soldier, from death to life. An old saying is, the ground is always level at the foot of the cross. It was in the first century, and it still is today. The foot of the cross is where everyone, poor and rich, finds level ground to kneel and embrace the Christ who died for them. Truly, this is the Son of God. We have heard and we have believed. The journey must not end there. We must have a passion for knowing Him deeper. May that same desire burn in our hearts, so we might honestly know the One who loved us and gave Himself for us. One can't help but wonder about how coming in contact with Jesus affected the soldiers' lives. Did they become Christians? God had already taken the initiative in salvation. Christ died for you. Now, it's your move. Jesus gave up his life so we could have ours back. He died like us so we could live like him. He not only pleased his Father, but received us as a bounty— as a substitute for sinful humanity, Jesus suffered the withdrawal of the Father's fellowship. Horrible as this was, it fulfilled God's good and loving plan of redemption. There are others who consider this to be a myth or at best a theological story. These are all unique events that uniformly testify to God's unique acts in human history. These are extraordinary, supernatural testimonies that confirm that Jesus is who he had claimed to be. However, this is not the only time God's power took over the heavens. Four times God's power took over the heavens. Number one, the day that the sun and moon stood still. In the book of Joshua, we see a classic illustration of God's power. When the Gibeonites, an ally of the Israelites, were attacked by five kings, the Gibeonites sent an appeal for military assistance to Joshua. Joshua chapter 10 verses 6 through 9. Then the men of Gibeon sent word to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal, saying, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that live in the hill country have assembled against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the valiant warriors. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have handed them over to you. Not one of them will stand against you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly by marching all night from Gilgal. Once again, Joshua heard those comforting words from the mouth of the Lord. Do not fear them. He had heard them before the victory at Jericho and before the successful ambush of Ai. They guaranteed triumph despite the size of the opposition. The result? Israel fought. The Lord threw the enemy into confusion, and a great victory resulted. 
The account shows an unusual combination of the human and divine. The army battled, but God did two miracles for Israel's victory. The Lord sent hailstones, killing more enemy soldiers than Joshua and his men killed. As the battle raged, Joshua realized they needed more daylight to finish. In sight of all of Israel, Joshua prayed for the sun and moon to stand still. Joshua chapter 10 verses 12 through 13 says, Then Joshua spoke to the Lord on the day when the Lord turned the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said, In the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon at the valley of Ijalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Joshua? And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hurry to go down for about a whole day. God heard and answered Joshua's prayer, and the Israelites defeated their enemies. This miracle was a supernatural intervention of God into the ordinary course of nature. God does what He chooses to do with His own creation. If God wants to stop or start His Son, He can. If we believe in a God of miracles, we don't have any problem believing that the sun stood still. We can also see a spiritual message in this miracle. Sometimes in the spiritual battles of life, God supernaturally intervenes immediately. In answer to prayer, He may choose to heal in a miraculous fashion, remove a problem, or provide for a need in a way that completely amazes us. Miracles are no problem for the Lord. After the battle, the five kings were brought before Joshua and his captains. He then had the captains of his army put their feet on the necks of the kings. This military practice illustrated the complete defeat of the enemy. Number two, the Egyptian plague. After years in bondage under the Pharaoh, Moses tells the Pharaoh to let the enslaved people go. However, the leader refused, and God sent a series of plagues on Egypt. The ninth plague showed the power of God over the skies. The ninth plague came as a surprise to Pharaoh. For three days, the Lord simply cast darkness over Egypt. It was so bad, so oppressive and all-encompassing that the Egyptians did not move during that period. However, the Israelites had light where they lived, which was a miracle. Pharaoh made a half-hearted submission attempt, allowing the Israelite families to leave but insisting that the flocks and herds stay behind. Moses, on the other hand, would not budge. He understood that partial obedience to God is disobedience. Moses insisted on taking all the livestock with them because the people would not know what they needed until they arrived in the wilderness. Pharaoh was so enraged by this that he warned Moses not to appear before him again. Number 4. The day Jesus returns, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. When Jesus comes back to earth, there will be signs that we are warned to keep an eye out for in the Bible. Jesus told us to watch and pray. What do we watch? We cannot stand still and watch the clouds wait for Him to appear. That is not what He meant. He meant, keep an eye on what's going on in the world and see what signs I give you to help you prepare. Signals are the signs. So, let's look at Matthew chapter 24, where the disciples asked him, What will be the signs or signals of your return? What would we do if we didn't know when it's going to happen? To their inquiry, Jesus gave a direct and unambiguous answer. We can thank God that he responded in such a straightforward manner. Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 5. While Jesus was seated on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will this destruction of the temple take place, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end, completion, consummation of the age? Jesus answered, Be careful that no one misleads you, deceiving you and leading you into error. For many will come in my name misusing it, and appropriating the strength of the name which belongs to me, saying, I am the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed, and they will mislead many. In the book of Revelation, he gives a much more detailed and comprehensive response, but here he gives a rundown of the signs that will precede his arrival. The disciples approached Jesus secretly as he was seated on the Mount of Olives. This conversation takes place in Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 36. Now in that passage, he gave four distinct signs of his coming. The first sign is disasters in the world, and he notes, for example, wars, famines, and earthquakes. The church, not the world is the second sign of His coming. 
that takes us to the third sign of the end times, Jerusalem's distress. Then Jesus says that the fourth sign of his coming will come instantly after that. So we shall know when he is coming, and we shall be ready. There will be no risk of false prophets or messiahs when that sign comes. There will be no deception, and it will be too quick. What will happen is that all natural light will be switched off. The sun will go dark, and the stars will fall. Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 31. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet blast, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. There are many predictions of this in the Bible. Isaiah predicts it. The heavens will be rolled up like a carpet. Isaiah chapter 34 verse 4. All the host of heaven will be dissolved, and the skies will be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts, the stars and the planets, will also wither away, as a leaf withers from the vine, and as a fig withers from the fig tree. The natural light will be gone, leaving only artificial light illuminating the earth. What is happening? What is going on? People may ask. This is it, Christians will exclaim. The sun, stars, and moon stop shining right before that happens. God turns off the lights of heaven to prepare for the blaze of light from the lightning that will mark his return. Then he comes on the clouds back to planet Earth, and we meet him. We are not meeting in an earthly stadium because there isn't one large enough to accommodate such a large crowd. We'll reach him in the air, and that'll suffice. Isn't that a fantastic prospect? When you see all these things, you know he is at the gates, just about to walk through, he says. The Son of Man will come after the time of tribulation. Here, distress connects with Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, to point to a specific period of great tribulation. The adverbial expression, immediately after, emphasizes that the celestial signs and the coming of Jesus will occur after the time of great distress. Heavenly Disturbances The end of the age will come with great disturbances in the heavens, with darkened skies, falling stars, the disruption of the forces of this age, and finally the coming of Jesus. However, where did Jesus go after his death? Hades, hell, or Sheol? To find out this and more, click here.